Good afternoon. Okay. Today is Monday, April 6th, uh, 3 p.m., speaking from Miami time, and I'm here with Gerald Caden. Uh, Gerald, thank you so much for taking a few minutes to speak with me today. Sure, I'm delighted to be here, sort of. Gerald, where, uh, can you tell us where you are right now and how the uh, recent events of the COVID-19 virus have maybe changed the structure of your life and work? Yes. So uh, I am at home in Cambridge, about a mile from the Graduate School of Design, my normal place of work. Um, and I am continuing to function professionally uh, as I did before, except for the one big change, which is, of course, doing everything remotely. And for me, this term, it's been sort of odd because of the very course that I'm teaching. Um, I frequently teach a seminar on physical public space. It's entitled Public Space. And indeed, the entire conceit of the seminar is that uh, physical public space is important. Uh, the opening sentence in my syllabus is, in a digital age, does physical public space matter? And of course, I always intended that question to be a rhetorical one. Of course it matters. People need physical public space. And we should focus on thinking about the attributes of physical public space and how to plan and design better physical public spaces. And so in the middle of the term of teaching this course, suddenly we, I as professor and the 18 students are operating in digital public space or digital space. And, and it's made us all think uh, more clearly about the distinctions between the two. Although I don't think anybody has been persuaded that the goal is better than the physical. And indeed, uh, it is better to be in a classroom with people all around, one's ability to canvas the room, to use peripheral vision, and I could go on and on. All of the things that we know as human beings are, are better deployed when you have that face-to-face -face contact uh, is simply not achieved on the Zoom platform as, as good or as at least acceptable as it may be. Have you found yourself having to change certain formats um, in, in your course to adjust for this, or is it too soon to, to even ask that question? No, it's not too soon to ask the question. I will say that because of the size of my course, which is fairly small, I have thought that it would be most reassuring to all of us, me as the professor and the students as well, if we could try and conduct the seminar as we have done so throughout the semester, which is to uh, have some key points uh, delivered by me, have conversations in which people can more or less speak when they would like to. And I've tried to make that happen as much as possible. There is a little bit of clunkiness when you have uh, 18 heads arrayed on the screen and people can't interrupt as easily uh, with uh, civility. Uh, there's the mute, unmute function, which those of us who use Zoom have gotten to know. Uh, the chat function of Zoom, where people can ask questions, is hard for me as a professor to actually manage because I'm trying to co uh, concentrate on what pe people want to say. But I've tried to go uh, analog as much as possible. And by that, I mean that instead of using the digital hand raised function in Zoom, I just ask people to. Rare hand like this, and then I say, so and so, Terry, go ahead, what do you have to say? So I've, I've tried intentionally in a way to stay as analog, as in person as possible. Um, I do think with larger courses, there are things about the Zoom function that could change the way one could teach. But for, for now, uh, I haven't used this as that kind of opportunity in this seminar. Yeah. Well, I think there will be quite a lot of a discussion about this moving forward and the sort of crisis has required us to actually move online. And so this will be a moment of exploration and hopefully some shared lessons. So look forward to hearing more about the transition. Um, so well, we, we, we know, by the way, I mean, there's that famous phrase, a crisis is a terrible thing to waste. <laughs> uh, and people want to rethink things. And I'm, I'm all for that. But, uh, but actually, a lot of students have been, and a lot of professors have been, if not traumatized, have really been affected emotionally by what is happening. 
for all sorts of reasons. This has been an enormous disruption for the students. I mean, for me, I'm at home where I always have lived. For them, they were sent away from the campus. They're scattered around the world. And uh, this is difficult. So I have not viewed this as the moment to really uproot them in terms of the patterns of, of teaching and the patterns of a seminar. Um, I opened the class by asking them how they are feeling personally, and a number of students talk about what's happening to them. And it's a moment in which they gather together, and I think very much appreciate the community that this Zoom platform allows us, or any platform that one could use, Microsoft Teams, whatever it may be, but we're using Zoom. It allows them to, to come together. As we read about people are doing, and my students have mentioned they're doing virtual, uh, you know, after hours drinks or virtual dinners. Um, and that's all great. I think it's, it's an effort to reconstitute virtually what actually happens in real life. I think were this to continue, and if I really wanted to think through how I might use remote learning as a regular part of what I do, there would be things uh, to change. And I, I look forward to thinking about that, but not, not at this exact moment when I think we all crave a sort of, as much as possible, mimicking uh, the normal classroom experience. No, I, I think that makes a lot of sense and will probably resonate with many, including myself. I mean, we're of course going through this as well here in Miami. Um, and I know that it's really early. Um, these interviews are meant to be initial reflections, um, not any kind of conclusions uh, of any kind. And so uh, I, I thought maybe I'd segue into the, the second question, which is, um, from your home there in Cambridge, maybe two weeks into this and kind of reality, uh, what impact do you think these recent events might, might have on the world of architecture or perhaps the future design of cities, if, if any? Uh, I was just curious to, to know your, your, your right. initial thoughts. So, I mean, I'll, the truth of the matter is, of course, that nobody knows. Um, and honestly, I, I right now think it's, it's a little early for these sorts of prognostications. And yet here I am doing this interview with you. So I've, I've agreed at least to participate in thinking about it. Uh, but I really, really mean that, that we, don't, we just don't know. I mean, the big question is, will there be a fundamental change in the status of cities worldwide? Of course, there's no such thing as a worldwide city. Each city is different in a different context, economic, political, uh, environmental, legal, uh, and all of the other aspects that determine what kind of city uh, there actually is. Obviously, in some big picture discussion, one can see that this sort of pandemic um, as turning against the very strengths uh, that cities have. That is to say, their, their density, their propinquities, that's, that's what makes cities so powerful as an engine for creating jobs and, and wealth. Um, and yet this pandemic turns those very strengths into weaknesses of cities. And that leads to the question of whether there will be indeed a fundamental change. And I think it will depend, of course, on the actual nature of the pandemic over time. And it will also depend on what sort of behavioral changes occur whether it's because of the actual pandemic or the perceived pandemic in people's minds. And that's why the experts, it seems to me, that should be opining on this are not so much planners or architects or economists or epidemiologists. Uh, perhaps it's time to turn to psychologists and really ask them what they think people's attitudes will be as they confront these sorts of, of, of changes. Uh, Cities have and will always have an enormous amount going for them. Uh, first of all, there's a huge investment in cities simply in terms of the built environment, the very infrastructure that makes up cities. That's a lot of embedded capital uh, that is incredibly valuable. Second, human beings crave face-to-face -face rather than screen-to-screen -screen contact. And I don't need an MRI machine scanning my brain or somebody else's brain and showing where, what part of the brain lights up when people have face-to-face -face contact, to know that that is simply a fundamental aspect of being a human being. If they differ, uh, and, and we 
demand socialness that is best accommodated, uh, obviously, in cities. And third, and part of all this is the nature of proximity and density and propinquity, which allow for this social contact to occur and again, allow for the creation of jobs and wealth. Wealth. Um, economists refer to agglomeration economies, uh, whatever technical term or non-technical term one wants to use, cities provide an enormous amount of value for society as a whole. So with all of that going for them, will this pandemic or will perceptions about this pandemic or future pandemics result in a sea change about our actual use of cities or our attitudes towards cities that then result in a different kind of use? And I, I'm skeptical that it will have the enormous sea change effect, but it will all depend on the nature and resolution of this sort of pandemic. Uh, we know that there are already trends away from some aspects of density. Uh, there's a trend away from bricks and mortar retail. We all know about that with uh, home deliveries, with ordering online. Um, what's a library when a book is a click away? What's a bookstore when a book is a click away? What's a, what's a movie theater or cinema when a movie is a click away? All of these things, having nothing to do with the pandemic have resulted to some degree in a lessening of the, the value of, of density and propinquity. And yet experiential activity and entertainment are crucial parts of cities. Uh, yes, you can order takeout, but people do like to go out and participate as we know in, uh, in restaurants and in walking on the street and, and seeing people. So we have attention here. Uh, we have the very fundamental values of cities, which have stood them in great stead over many, many centuries and that have been very important. As I said, in a digital age, does physical public space still matter? My answer is yes. People prefer to actually, for a lot of their time, go out and be with others in a variety of spaces, private, semi-private, semi-public, uh, public. Uh, it's hard to see that change unless uh, the fear or the reality of the pandemic or future pandemics is so real that it really changes the calculus so that people will no longer go to a crowded restaurant or club or they won't use subways or light rail or buses. Or maybe companies will decide actually, <clears throat> regardless of the pandemic, that remote working is far more manageable than they actually thought and that a centralized location is thus less necessary. Will tourism and globalism decline because of this or be restricted because of this? And again, will public spaces be less valuable? Will I worry about sitting on a park bench because I'm wondering who sat there immediately prior to my sitting there? Uh, or will I not want to touch clothes in a store because maybe somebody tried it on who had uh, the coronavirus or some other pandemic. So these are all questions, and they're questions that I think do not have answers now. I think it would be almost promiscuous to really, at this moment, uh, make uh, prognostications with any degree of confidence. So I'm happy to speculate about hypotheticals, to think it through. I love cities. I'm fearful uh, for what might happen, but I'm not jumping on the bandwagon of those people who have always thought that cities are less good than the suburbs. And there are people who are now almost triumphal, triumphalists in stating that, you see, I always said that cities would die, and this is just going to push them closer to their death. Um, but I'm also aware that uh, this could result in a different attitude of people. And I think it's simply too early to tell whether there will be a true secular change. I'm doubtful about that, uh, but uh, at this time of recording, uh, we'll, we'll see. Maybe it's just a simple follow-up in hearing you, many of the excellent questions that you're raising. Um, I, I'm curious if it might not be either or, my, meaning the hyper-dense city and then maybe the suburb, but whether you think it might um, there might be a space for something in between, basically. 
um, where, where, where you have the vitality of the city um, that is oftentimes absent in the suburb, but perhaps without or calling into question the hyperdensities that might cause the pandemics to take hold. I don't know if, um, if, if, if you might be suggesting that there might be other models. To the density in cities as hyperdensity. I refer to it as density. Um, so the question really is, can you still have a city and design for or plan for lesser densities? In other words, to retrofit the city. Uh, I've thought and I've been asked uh, over the past uh, month or so uh, from various institutions to help them with public space and physical distancing. The place has been social distancing, but it's really physical distancing. Um, how can we reconfigure our tables and chairs uh, such that people are sitting or standing at least six feet apart? And I've actually helped with reconfiguration of plans of that sort. That's a temporary sort of thing, and one could imagine doing that. One could imagine uh, spray painting sidewalks with six feet markers. One could imagine putting a sign on a public space that says the capacity of these, this space is actually half of what the full capacity is. So one can imagine doing all sorts of planning and designing that actually reduces the density of, of a city. Uh, do I think that that's the future of cities? Uh, do I think that, that we will really, in a way, move toward less dense, more suburban conditions within the city itself? I surely hope not. I'm not even optimistic that one can really do that. If, if that, that is where we are with regard to cities, then I think we might see you know, a very different kind of development pattern um, that almost eschews the very nature of cities. So do I think there's a halfway point? Do I think that good design and planning can actually de-densify the city? Uh, I think there is theoretically, but I think it cuts against the very nature of what a city is. And I have some degree of skepticism about that sort of thing. Okay, well, I think on that note, uh, and I'm hoping that the footage caught that last sentence. Of course, this is in real time, so we have to accept the limitations of the digital medium. But I, I think that um, you've raised a lot of, I think, important questions, which I think is, um, is an important assessment at the moment because we really are at just the beginning of this. And I, I'm very grateful for you having taken the time um, to speak with me about it. Um, because I think this affords us a, a virtual community to have discussions among individuals that care about the future um, design of cities. So thank you so much for, for the conversation. Well, I hope I have contributed in some way uh, beyond just throwing spitballs at the wall, but I really think that's sort of where we are at this moment. And uh, we'll, we'll get through this and, uh, and hopefully learn a lot. So thank you, Carrie. Thank you. Thank you so much.